gratifying. Let me, let me ask you about the, the competition and how that helps, say, with uh, recruitment and, and retention. I mean, for years we believe it has. And I think Mike can probably speak better to it. Mike, do Well, we have no problem retaining the winners, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you, we, we're probably one of the first to enter in this space, and we, I think we have good, uh, a lot of people know about the event. You know, I couldn't sit here and tell you that people come to us to participate in that event, but it absolutely uh, is something that people in our organization do aspire to. I think our, our participation, as, as Don Aaron earlier, that we have about... Our rate was up this year, wasn't yeah, it? 1,400 people out of about way. almost 2,000. It's about 70%. So I think that's probably the best best index we got we have. And uh, so people get pretty excited. I, people get pretty excited about it. There's a genuine desire to win, for sure. and. Uh, it doesn't. It definitely enables it, but it's, the retention and, and recruiting is part of a, a broader, yes. much more broader effort. But it's a piece, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, all these those type of efforts are not just one singular thing, right? It's not one singular enabler at this point. There's, but this is a big one. It has been for us for years, and it's grown. You know, we like to believe it's, 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 a, it's a part of that package, right? Mm -hmm. That allows us to, you know, recruit the top, you know, you know the top people in the fields uh, that we, you know, the business we're in. Right? It's, I was thinking about it earlier. It seems like a great opportunity for OEMs as well. You have a lot of interest here at, at work that can really benefit. Mm -hmm. it, it is. Actually, it's a good opportunity for uh, both OEMs and customers. We, our OEMs help. Without our OEMs and, our, and actually our suppliers, they, they sponsor a lot. So it's, they come in, they get the interface with the technicians. Uh, they have some training programs. We, this year we added our salespeople to it. Yeah, so you added your a, yeah, we, we had 350 aftermarket salespeople this year. Uh, Which is the first we've ever done. So the suppliers love it. The OEs, the, it's a good opportunity for the OEs. Uh, we, we train them a little bit. That, that's what really their, uh, their their primary interest is in. And they just they can't get this solid, they can't get this interface with in any other venue. So it is a good opportunity. And, but they, they, they help pay for it. So that's that. Without them, we couldn't do it. Have you had a chance to gauge response from uh, aftermarket sales yet? Uh, since this, this was their is our first, first time, one. first time. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I would tell you, just got uh, <laughs> I have a saying that the first is the worst, and this this is the worst one we ever do. We're going to be in in pretty good shape. They were really excited. We have a couple of new new vice presidents in it that did a great job. Jody Pollard and Rob Nixon really have done a bang up job. They added that this year. Uh, they've done a good job of taking the the rodeo to the next level. Uh, and, but I will tell you the response will be very positive. They, these, guys, uh, these guys are seeing things that, that, that the tools that we're trying to develop for them to, to enable them, and they're pretty fired up about it. They yeah. really are. It's not just on the outside. I think it's the tools that we, from a corporate perspective, try to develop to put in there, in their toolbox, right? Mm -hmm. You can't send someone to work without a, a toolbox full of tools, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that may sound simplistic, man, sound-wise, but we've worked very hard, and I'm not going to get into all the details, but as an organization, we have invested a lot in the last three years to, uh, you know, to allow our people to, you know, uh, you know be, succeed mm -hmm. at, you know, at their job, you know, succeed to a level that we believe is, uh, uh, will, <laughs> it works for us as an organization. You know, we mentioned earlier, too, the way that it, it's just part of your kind of culture here, where you're bringing all these guys to the, the corporate headquarters, kind of like a meet the family kind of thing. How sure. important is that in, in terms of the, this company culture and, and Getting everybody kind of. Yeah. I'm a culture. I'm a culture nut. I'll cry, I, I'm a culture nut, and I was. I wasn't able to participate these two days, but it's just. It, it can't be just me. The level of Mike and his team, when he talked about Jody and Rob, it's not just them. There are hundreds of other people that you know continue to try to create that culture and push it down. You know, that's probably one of the toughest things for me um, since you know Russia enterprises or Russia trucks and right. It's tough for me, but. I don't get to know all the 6,500 people anymore, right? So, and culture is huge, right? Because businesses, businesses are not just uh, P and Ls and balance sheets. Yeah, you know what those are? That's a scorecard. But at the end of the day, there are so many things above that that create the revenue, that create that culture with the employees and engagement with the employees and, and driven towards engagement with customers. Um, so it's huge. I mean, from the, you know, I don't get to spend that time, but watch me tonight. Uh, I'll be there. And with bells on, uh, just doing it because I so much truly enjoy or appreciate. You know, as you get older in life, sometimes you uh, in business, and I know we get into all that, but that culture is a part. But you still your appreciation for things as you see them grow, you know, and and, and, and go beyond what you could do yourselves, but driven, not driven, but but driven by your employees, by themselves. They feed on each other, right? 
so when you start that, you know, every every little fire starts with a spark, you know, in a flame, right? Um, you know, it doesn't just it doesn't start like that. So it's it's just awesome for me um, to watch and see um, where it's progressed to, and uh, and get to hang out with those guys tonight. And when I say guys again, it's a generic term. I'm just rusty. <laughs> There's ladies here too. I can't help myself. Uh, from Texas, and uh, but it's just it's really it's really awesome because you can see it being pushed down not by you having because I can't do it. It has to be something that feeds upon itself sometimes, right? And it feeds upon itself because of the quality of the people that enjoy and get together and they succeed. Because there's nothing better than success to drive people to want to be a part of something, right? So, anyway. But I, I would add that we're, we're as integrated as we've ever been. I, I, I think, yeah. and, I, and we have uh, whether it's by design or not five or six guys that have worked out in the field before who have who've done it before. Uh, so I think that's an important part of having these guys, some people in the field work at Corp, but I think that's enabling that, that additional integration that's we're improving upon. Right. Mm -hmm. We've had some, as Mike mentioned earlier, we've had some folks join us from the field. Because it's a constant. When you get large, sometimes you don't lose, well, listen, we don't lose touch, but you want to continue to grow that touch. So you have to bring in that touch. And I think this year, from what Mike's told me, Couple of people I've talked to uh, was you know, twelve year was as he said was the best is the last the worst is the last one he did and can't wait to do another one next year. To be honest with you. How about the uh, the economy then? How's it been for uh, for trucking as of late? Okay, uh, well, I do this a lot. <laughs> I speak to this a lot, but at the same time, you know, you started the year. I always start back. And sometimes it's better to understand where you're at and where you're going. Got to understand a little bit where you've been. And you know, the year was supposed to be a little tougher. It turned out, you know, things turned up. You know, when you look at some ACT's numbers from a truck perspective, Class A, it was gonna be about 154, 55,000. Ends up probably gonna be the 195, 197 range for US, class US retail. That's, I'm always talking US retail because that's what we do. So obviously a bump of, you know, close to 25, 30%, right? 30% better than what, 30 better than what people anticipated coming in. So that's made it better at the same time you know, it's been pretty broad for us, um, from coast to coast, and in between. I mean, I'm gonna, I don't want to go into, like I'm talking to analysts right now or something, or investors, but at the same time, it's been very, it's been broad-based, from California to Florida, and in between. Hmm. And whether it's on the uh, Navistar side, the Peterbilt side, or even all the medium duty side, was, you know, we've had, it's been very broad-based uh, across the organization. So we feel good about where we've been. Now, of course, we're in the wintertime, at the same time, I can tell you, I feel as good as I usually feel in December. Uh, Typically, you know, November, December, January, February, you get a little bit nervous, right? Because you're, you're in the holiday frame and, and things like that. And uh, see, I typically am, but right now I'm not nervous. I'm cautiously optimistic, let's say, uh, about where we're at and where we're headed. I think next year's obviously the numbers are going to be higher from a delivery <laughs> perspective uh, from Class A vehicles. and medium booty has been strong. It should remain somewhere around where it's been. So, you know, you feel good about it. And, but as I said, cautiously optimistic to continue the momentum that we've seen over, basically over the whole year, really the last three, maybe the last three quarters of the year. So you're cautiously optimistic in this? I just say that because I'm going to be cautious. This time of year, I'm going to be cautious and no one's going to get me outside of that. I'm going to say, is there anything good you're looking for particularly? Is there anything bad you're worried about particularly? Oh, no, there's outside. nothing in particular. No. I just, no, not in particular. Mm -hmm. You just get, <laughs> I've done this long enough, and, and you just get a little bit nervous when things are running pretty good, really well, mm -hmm. right? Just It's just the nature, right? I'm not one that's going to run out. I'm not out here to promote above and beyond what I see, but what I see is good. So let's just continue where we're at, continue the pace. And as an organization, I think it's, uh, Key that we, that's the market, and then, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get too deep in the rush, but at the same time, I feel good about where we're at as an organization, regardless of where the market goes. I really do. I did want to pick your brain on um, electric trucks. I know people that see oh, darn, I knew it was coming. Yeah. Yeah. I usually, if I start an investor, I usually walk in and say, can I just talk about electric right now and get it over there? <laughs> At the same time, you got international suddenly interested in and in talking about it, obviously with Volkswagen technology, and there's just a lot Everybody. of happening. So, well, mm -hmm. here's the deal. <laughs> My opinion, electric will be, have, no question it's going to be in the space, right? Now, where does it fall in? How does it fit? My opinion, 
right, wrong, or indifferent. It's more on the medium duty, uh, city delivery, uh, uh, local P and D, that type of stuff. It's not going to be in the next two or three years. I'm not going to opine upon one person that only builds electrical trucks out of California. Uh, I'm because I'm not quite sure I buy the model with no distribution, no service centers, none of that to make it work. I'm, I may work in, in the consumer side of cars, but I don't think in the commercial side that fits. I do believe that, you know, when we step back 10 years from now and we look or whatever time frame you want to put on it, uh, the OEMs will still be. All it will be is uh, there'll be offerings. You'll have, you'll have a diesel offering, you'll have a natural gas offering, you'll have an electrical offering, driven by market segments as much as anything else driven by where, you know, what job are they trying to perform, right, from a commercial perspective. I have a hard time in the next 10 to 15 years really seeing it in the TL side. I really do uh, on the over the road because there's just a lot of, there's a lot of things in my mind that, you know, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's, you know, payload, there's a lot of things that are involved that I think will be headwinds. But at the same time, it's going to be a part of offerings that we will learn how to deal with as dealers and it's like six seven years ago any new store we built i put a couple natural gas bays in. now natural gas is supposed to be 10 to 15 percent now it's three i still think it'll end up being a piece of the game just like electric will be a piece so guess what as we redesign facilities going forward we'll try to understand you know if i've got a 40 bay shop we're going to build and we might have a couple natural gas and we might have a couple Whatever it takes, and I'm, I'm not an expert by any stretch, whatever that takes to handle the electrical piece, because I do believe it will be a part of the OEM offerings, and they'll just be you know, multifaceted offerings. Well, and, and with these changes, how, how does the technician job have to evolve? That will be interesting to watch. I mean, the technician job, let's, let's just go ret in retrospect again. Look where it's come from to where it is now. My, I mean, you know, the, the, the guys, you know, it's not the same. You know, it's not the same business anymore. It was twenty years. The, the true answer is we really don't know. But but I would tell you, there's less moving parts in an electric motor than there no in a diesel engine. You know how disruptive that will be. Uh, I, I agree with everything that Rusty said. Uh, by you can look at all the projections, kind of pinpoint. It's not. It's probably not going to be in the truckload space anytime soon. It's going to be you know, it's going to be last mile stuff. And even then, it's going to be a share. So, what if it, as you get to last mile, there's also projected growth in growth in, uh, in vehicle sales. So. How that would impact that, it, it remains to be seen. Logic would tell you that it could impact, uh, that the technicians would be way more technical, uh, but the, just the difference in moving parts between a, between a diesel we'll engine and an electric vehicle would suggest you have to understand that a little bit better. So well, how realistic is it then when you've got, say, the push in Europe and also now California, they, they, they want to go ahead and get diesel out of the equation, right? Especially in California, there's been that big push vis-a-vis -vis Governor Brown. I mean, how realistic is that? To the, I don't believe it's realistic <laughs> on the Class 8 side. I mean, the, the, to be electrical or just to get diesel To actually out? phase out internal combustion engines in, Cal in the sake of California. Uh, I don't know how realistic that is. Well, you, you're not going to be able to do it on the Class 8 side probably in our careers. But, no. Uh, and, 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 and maybe. C and G's in hybrid, and hybrids too will play will also play a role in that space. Uh, but getting it completely out of there, the, the DC and well, the costs are going to be so. look. The technology in the oil and gas space, I don't, I don't look for a hundred and fifty dollar barrel of oil anytime soon. Okay, technology has shown us with fracking and all the things we we can. We, we're an energy producing country right now. When you look at it from that perspective, when it comes to fossil fuels, right? I mean, you're in the state, right? I mean, half the rigs that are working in the United States right now. I was ready yesterday. There's nine hundred forty rigs. They're in the state of Texas. Um, because it's easy, it's not hard to get it out of the ground. This technology is allowed us. It's going to keep the cost of fuel down. And as long as you do that, and you look at the engines that are built nowadays, you know what? <laughs> electrical burn the carbon <laughs> carbon footprint of electrical. When you look at the, the the plants that produce electricity, are just as much or more than diesel right now. <laughs> That's my thing. And most of the CNG, even the CNG trucks in the space, and, and uh, it's all in grants. So right. you have the Volkswagen money Spunded. coming out that's going to play a role in that. Each state's uh, trustee will, just, will put a program around that in the mix between mm -hmm. who, who gets it in terms of municipalities, what mm -hmm. the grant amounts are versus CNG versus battery. So depending on the local political environment, mm -hmm. the state political environment, they can really skew that. Mm -hmm. But it's unlikely anytime soon that uh, at, once the Volkswagen money is gone, uh, it's still way more expensive as we sit here today. 
Uh, you still don't you know, have the length of haul on them, so the battery technology needs to continue to evolve. You know, it's going to happen, as Rusty said, but I think it's going to be very gradual. Mm -hmm. And the uh, issue of, say, renewable diesel, right, and dimethyl ether, just drop-in fuels that can just instantly reduce emissions, how much of a role do you think fuels like that might play, then, in the, in the diesel segment? Well, I, I'm not sure everybody has their head around renewable diesel just yet. Okay. Even okay. in California. I, I live in California, so I'm, 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 I live and breathe and stuff, no pun intended. Uh, but the renewable aspect of that, I don't, you know, first I don't think the energy companies have done a good job at, at educating the politicians in that deal, but I think it's very, that, that renewable is very, very viable. And it's clean. Mm -hmm. So let's talk uh, technicians, right? It's all about technicians. Um, is there a technician shortage? What are you seeing with technician mm -hmm. hiring? Trent, I mean, run the numbers. How many are coming okay, in? There is a technician shortage. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to a technician shortage, a technician shortage, there is probably a, uh, uh, inbound to the school shortage so it, it, it just is we could we could probably hire 500 right now i was talking to one of my regional managers in, in ohio like, how many do you need tomorrow how you give me this 50. that's that's ohio hmm. so there is absolutely a technician shortage and uh, there's no supply change in sight on that so it seems kind of modifies the way you're going to go to market what are you seeing with like the average age of your your technician Force all, or is it still pretty high? Is it it's still like pretty high. I mean, we, we've got we've got things we're trying to do to combat that, and, and we've got to develop younger talent. It's just really that simple, and, and as well as attract them into the industry to begin with. You know, in this tech age. Yeah. And the uh, ASA, I was uh, talking to uh, one of their reps uh, here just uh, yesterday, and it was mentioned that they'd like to get into the public schools, even at the middle school level, high school level, to start recruiting some of that talent. So what, uh, what, what do you make of that? Well, they absolutely have to get into the high schools. We've talked about that ourselves. Mm -hmm. you know, so how, how you go about that, I, I'm not really prepared to talk about, but mm -hmm. I, it does have to start in high school. But you do have active programs with other schools, with both yeah. tech schools. We have a lot of active programs right now. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's people a lot dedicated of to there. that work. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I even saw it, like a refer a tech like, booth in the, in the, you know, the trade show, mm -hmm. where you're having like technicians refer you know, other people they think might be good, and you're giving out like a raffle for it. Um, you know, what, what kind well, of other initiatives are you doing like that? Well, one exactly like that. You'll see tonight we've got uh, Stuart Haas here with Clint Boyer, and we had a contest throughout the year that uh, if you referred technicians, other you know, local technicians, uh, then your name went in, and you know, we took five technicians to a race, and, you know, with their service managers. And we had 200, I don't know, 220, 30, mm -hmm. some odd referrals, and we hired a half of them. Okay? So, you know, that's a pretty good investment, right? Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time. So, those types of things, you know, I mean, you know, I don't know if we get bonus programs going to or things like that. Also, my well, there's referrals, there's referral programs. I, I would tell you the biggest change in our approach is we're really, uh, for the first time since I've been here, targeting the young, accepting that we're going to have to develop our younger people. Right, exactly. level one, level two. And right. make those investments both from a recruiting standpoint, in other words, creating awareness of the opportunity to a development standpoint for the training. And, and I would tell you that's the biggest investment we're making right now. Is investing in the younger techs? Investing in the effort and investing in their development. And, and trying to bring in work that really better matches their skills. Oh, okay. So, so you're doing some some innovative stuff, or are you trying to? Oh, I wouldn't. I'm not, I wouldn't characterize it as innovative, but <laughs> I, I would. Carry, I would say it's definitely. Uh, it's a focus, mm -hmm. and there's a plan, and there's a, a plan behind it, a strategy behind it. The innovative stuff is typically dealer. You know, one one example, and I just say it's an example. Maybe with that, you know, we we, we don't do it. We haven't done a ton of PM work. You know, if we do it, it's, it's kind of by accident or by mobile. And this is a great. This is a great. First of all, there's plenty of it out there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a great way to get these guys. Uh, get started so they can get their hours and earn their pay. We have a mentor program, we've talked about that, that's evolving. We've got new leadership in, in the whole service realm, we've got, uh, which is a big part of it. So we don't, we don't never, we never approach anything with a single bullet. Mm -hmm. It's always a five point plan or a 10 point plan. And in this particular case, you've got a referral program, we're targeting local tax, we're, we're stepping up on, on the schools. Uh, and, but there, there is supply out there, uh, but if you're gonna get it and keep the competition, you gotta, you gotta make those investments for, on the recruiting side. Right. If you're trying, if there aren't enough technicians, and you're just kind of trying to look at it differently, see how you can get young, you know, uh, get some young guys in there and, and bring the age down. What about women? I mean, you know, we never see like uh, women technicians. It's very rare. Will we ever have like a, a you know woman rodeo champ? Do you think? I mean, is it, or is it jo a job they just it's not really conducive to? 
being a woman. I'm going to let you know. I'm going to let you know. I, I, <laughs> I, know it's, it's a question, I would, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, it, it's there. It's just not, it doesn't lend itself, historically speaking, to your point. We should do a better job, I would guess, in trying to, because the job the job description of a technician we talked about already has changed, right? So it should be more conducive to attracting, you know, as he spoke, I spoke a younger workforce, a more female, uh, you know, females into that workforce, I would tell you, we probably haven't done a very good job. I think the industry, I don't say ourselves, the industry is not going to do a good job of, you know, focusing on that. And that's a good idea, bro. I would say we, we are absolutely focused on taking advantage of, of those women and taking the thing about like the supply of labor <laughs> associated with the women that we haven't typically uh, been recruiting very hard. As far as the technician realm, I, I doubt, I'm not sure that... Yep. Uh, a lot of women in the population want to go go turn wrenches on a, on a now maybe when, when it goes to electric motor or flip, maybe they'll get in but in terms of management positions uh oh, counter positions, yes. Sales positions. Where, you, where they're not uh heavy lifting or you know, there's plenty of those but we need more women in the industry we're, we're very much about bringing that trying to bring that to fruition to, at our asr meeting we actually how, how many were there about 20 25 yeah yes so we're, we're almost mm -hmm. 10 we're almost 10 percent of our asr our outside sales people that were uh, uh, female. Yeah. We have uh, TMC had their first ever category uh, female winner this past year. Which For tech? Of, yeah. their super oh, maybe, tech. It's a, maybe it's a category. Yeah. I don't even know. No, how no, 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 no. It was, she, she was up there against the guys. And she, she, yeah, she took two or three categories away. Huh. Pretty neat. That's great. What are some of the bigger challenges uh, in, in retaining techs? Well, most of this pay, I would say, pay and mm -hmm. pay and development and training and, and career advancement. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, we've, we've, defined, we've identified those as areas we need to be very much about. Um, most of the, what we're, we're finding in our numbers is, you know, once we keep them past the year, it's that first year is the biggest challenge. Our turnover numbers there are, are higher in this proportion to once we, once we keep them past the year. So if we, if we can really be successful in enhancing our training, in that first year and, and recruit from the right places and have good screening processes and keep best that first year that really they're probably really up keeping longer it goes way up mm -hmm. for, and that's where i think that is the industry experience from the people i talk to with. how big of a role of off-site repair i mean that seems like that's that's growing yeah. quite quite it a bit is. and what, what's really driving that is it just surging number of trucks outside of service areas what well, think about trying to get to some of these big cities right mm -hmm. You know, the dynamics of population surging to metropolitan areas, right, which tends to be where they may have companies basically get, you know, moving around those areas is tough. And what it costs from a perspective of having someone take a truck, take it here, drop it off, pick it up. People are willing and understand the true cost. I don't think historically people have fully understood the total cost of doing that work, right? Just saying, well, I'm going to take it over, drop it off, and I'm going to pick it back up. But when you add that all together, it, what you have to, you know, the cost of the vehicle, first off, being down more probably, or the, and then the people that, you know, the, the requirement from a physical perspective of taking it, dropping it off, picking it back up, it is pretty, uh, makes sense from an economic perspective, depending on the job description, right? I mean, it's not like you can do every job mobile, but there are well, many, many jobs, especially when you've got a well-rigged, outfitted mobile fleet, which we do. I think we've got 300 plus, 50 on mobile techs out there right now that do a wide array, of, not just, you know, not just into one market segment, to many market segments, and and vehicles that are upfitted and equipped for all different types of repairs, you know, up to uh, up to everything just under engine overhauls and things like that. You know, we're pretty prepared to take care of it in the field. I would add, it's, it's out the hour every job every truck in the shop's an hour. It's a half hour there and it's a half hour back. Fuel, and probably most importantly, the ability to batch. You can go to the customer's place, you can control the hours, the truck's there, and you can hit, you can talk, you can do three or four or five trucks at the same time, as opposed to bringing three or four or five, pay the technician, pay the driver to bring it in, you're paying them to do it. So the cost alone for a decent sized fleet, they're, they're crazy if they're not using mobile, to be honest with you, because it's just, it's an hour, it's an hour per, per truck. And, the, then, and you see that uh, gaining popularity then as time goes on? Yeah. We're at Ready, mobile all the time. Oh, mm -hmm. and, there, and there's some people, uh, there's some customers where their trucks just 
not at a site that's conducive, it's, it's off-road, uh, the energy field, you're just not, they're not going to bring their truck in that. You really need to be there. The equipment's running, you have to be there. So there's several dynamics to it, but it's is cost and efficiency and probably just the, the yeah. geography of it all. Yeah, those type of markets, for sure, they're already mobile to them. But from a, you're seeing more customers who spoke about understand true cost of taking a vehicle to a shop. And it just makes sense for them, it makes sense. And we're, we're all in that game, mm -hmm. and have been, and continue to, our business, our business continues to grow in that sector. Is it pretty attractive for the techs then? I mean, essentially, yes. they're their own you'd bosses, find, they're on the... <laughs> you'd be surprised. I mean, it truly is very attractive for the techs. Yeah, I mean, here they're, they're mostly their own, like, uh, bosses. It's kind of like That's almost correct. a small business component or aspect. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a special recruiting process that you put them through to figure out who's going to be best on the road, or how do you uh, sure determine? Uh, no, not as we sit here today, no. Okay. Just when a position becomes available, it's well, just they... This, I, I can't speak for what that takes place at the local level. A manager mm -hmm. would handle that, and they probably each, Right now, there's no broad-based criteria. It would be strictly controlled by the region. Mm -hmm. But it, I think it takes a certain type of person to be able to do it. you got to be a little bit of a business man. There's administrative responsibilities that don't typically go with, uh, go with you know, a shot. Shop, a job in the shop. It seems like then the pay the, would be. You don't have the support of a foreman, you don't have the yeah. foreman, you don't have all those people that are with you. So at this point, you've got to be a little bit more of a businessman at the same time. So is the pay a little bit higher? Because you do, it sounds like you got more responsibility. It tends to be higher, yes. Okay. Not, not necessarily from an hourly standpoint, but more from just the amount of time you're out there. When we were here last year, we toured your very impressive telematic center. How's that initiative going? The call center? The, yeah, the call the center. Call center. Yeah. Well, I might go to the call center is evolving great. We, we, we've got the service call center. We he just keeps adding people. That's why I got you. You know, I, have I, I never get a day off on that. Anyways, it, it's going great to answer your question. All, all of our systems are configured. It's all there. Uh, we haven't even leveraged the tools that we have yet. Our parts call center, any overflow calls go there. And the people he's adding is that we've got a few missed calls we're still having, but we still feel we have the best in class answer rates in the industry. Uh, but it is, it's advancing. It's a good customer service tool. We love, we love to show it off, and they, they like to know that we're sitting there watching their equipment and monitoring it. Uh, you feel, um, you know, for a long time there was a lot of pushback. People didn't understand it. Um, right. They felt they were getting too much information, the wrong information. You feel like. You sort of on telematics per se. Yeah, yeah. On, the, on the on the concept of telematics and how it was executed. Do you feel your sort of the acceptance is rising among your? I customers? think the acceptance is rising, but I think that's I think it still exists. It's still too much information. But but I will tell you that companies and providers are getting better at the data. So instead of giving you everything, they're establishing minimum criteria before it even pierces the the information wall, if you will. Filtering. But it's still it's still an issue. If you're going to, if people are going to get 20 emails a day that this little thing's wrong, this little, little thing's wrong, they, they, they can't, it's not actionable. Right. So then they stop listening. So it's still an issue, but we're working hard, as are the providers, to make sure that the, it's more meaningful and, and actionable. You're still bullish on the long term. Absolutely. Well, the ELDs enabled that here in the short yeah. term. Uh, but long term, it's going to be in every truck, and, and you've got to get ahead of it. Uh, you said the ELDs were, you know, so we're... <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so we, yeah, just from, you know, just anecdotally and what you hear, I mean, what, when that hits, that's, we're, that's just a few days well, away now. That's going to go into effect. No. Okay. It's not until April. Right, the, the enforcement, the enforcement. They uh, say April for enforcement. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> laws, enactment of laws, <laughs> passing of laws, enactment of laws, and enforcement of laws are three separate things. And... I personally believe the ELD, it'll, it'll be there, it'll, it will work its way into the system. Some people say, oh, it's going to cause a 10% fall, it's not. And it's not. It's not that the ELD is that hard to do, it's easy. It's just the, the, the controls and can people make, a, can people survive not running, you know, a little bit uh, beyond the law, <laughs> should I say. Now, that'll be the part, you know, from a productivity perspective. You know, the, the smaller carriers that have typically been associated with, you know, running outside the lines a little bit. We'll see. Uh, but I think it'll take a full year, at least, to see really where it's at. Really, because you don't start really enforcing it right a little, you know, you get a, a warning or whatever till April, and then you start enforcement. And it'll be interesting for me to watch, see how the states and the feds and, 
how it gets sorted out. Because when it, eventually it's the states that have to, you know, enforce it, right? So we'll see uh, how it all works out. It, it'll take some. So if it, if everybody's always guessing, looking for a number. What's it take out, right? Yeah. What does it take out? Ah, I'm not the 10% guy by any stretch. Three, four, five max. You know, percent will come out. But that'll be replaced. Okay. But I've talked to some, uh, some tech guys who say that what you just said, that'll be the enabler. That's the moment where you can really sort of supercharge the integrated vehicle platform because now you've got sort of a central unit where all the arrows come together. And it really sort of superpowers the whole, everything goes together, time, time, wheel, the telematics. Right. Well, that, is that, and it's just really, it's the broad-based adoption that enforces that, because that's yeah. the one thing that really is going to force everybody's going to have to have it. So the device is a device, the capabilities inside of that. I mean, everybody's working to that end to have multiple good features and capabilities. So you have one device, safe safety, hours of service, and, and telematics also. So. I think it's more the adoption, the, broad, the forced adoption that will, everybody's working in that space already. D different, different providers have different strengths. Do the devices make it easier for the techs to do their jobs? Like when it comes to diagnosing an issue? It does. Or? Okay. First of all, it, it identifies, and, yeah, and it will power. continue to improve over time because the, each code will, will ultimately say, well, this is, this is really the, the diagnostic tree you need to go through. Here's the parts that go with that. So it, it absolutely keeps you from, especially for electrical stuff. A, a technician can spend two or three hours trying to find an electrical issue, and, and the telematics are fine tuning, you know, where to look on stuff like that. And, and, and identifying things that you wouldn't be able to know without, without that fault code. Hmm. We probably have time for one more. One yep. or two more. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Just a couple more minutes. I go rogue. Gotta keep folks. Rusty on his schedule. No See some more folks and then head down to the what, what were some of the bigger surprises for looking back on 2017? The market itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I, it was driven heavy by vocational early in the year. Mm -hmm. uh, the DL side seems to be picking up right now. Obviously, the last two months have been 36 and 32,000 units, Class 8. Basically, I think driven by the big truckload guys. It'll be interesting to see if your mid-sized uh, players and everybody falls in line, which is typically how it works. Then when you go into, because uh, you know everybody was a little, thought October was a little heavier than what was anticipated, as was November, which had a new truck show in Atlanta in September, which I think may have pulled forward some orders that typically uh, you would see over a four-month period. But going back to your question, just the the broad-based strength that I saw throughout the year. You know, it was broad-based strength. It wasn't driven by one market segment, whether it be construction or refuse or oil and gas or over the road. It was just, or regionally, you look at it from a regional perspective, whether it was the West Coast or it was Texas or it was, you know, Georgia or Florida or, you know, Arizona. You look at these places, it was very broad based from our organization. I'm looking at it from our perspective, right, in the markets that we cover. So 